apologize that I was I was slack in getting both slides and uh, we'll start with this. Getting both slides and video lectures up uh, recurrent, and I'll get stuff up. Uh, breakdown shoots. I'll get it. Try to get it all. Everything from today up to date. If you've missed classes, then just go back and watch the lectures and drop me an email and let me know uh, what day you're making up for. I'll give you credit for that class. Uh, let's talk about the my stuff that I assigned, which on one hand is kind of like, you know, I'm sitting here assigning the stuff I wrote. On the other hand, it's like, guys, this is, this is 40 years of software engineering. Distilled into little tiny chunks that are worth reading. <laughs> okay, we've talked about the same. So, how to retain IT talent with goal alignment. Uh, I did this originally as a column for baseline. Uh, and I've, I've mentioned this, so I won't go into a lot of detail on pages where we, were, we had all these very bright, very professional, mostly developers. Uh, and we're, the team was was in danger of literally flying apart. Uh, and Rick Gessner helped out some with, with uh, uh, some training he had had on simply how to talk to people, how to talk to people you disagree with without calling them idiots. Is basically what his what his training was. But the other thing we did was this offsite where, as as we've talked before, I had each and every team members, you know, what are your goals? Why are you here at Pages? Why did you join? Why did you accept the offer here? What do, you, what do you want to get out of this? And we made a big list, and then we came up with team goals we were committed to as a team that would meet everyone's individual goals. And then, and of course, I think Larry Spellhog, our CEO, would have, been, would have been pretty horrified if he'd done this. Then we said, OK, how do they support the company goals? <laughs> we didn't start with the company goals. We started with the individual team member goals, and then the goals as a team. And then said, OK, how does this fit into what Pages is trying to accomplish? Uh, and there was a subtext there of, and what do we need to change here at Pages in order to, in terms of the company's goals, in order to meet our, our personal and team professional goals? This is probably one of the single proudest things I'm proudest of. Over a four and a half year period, we had no engineer leave voluntarily. And this is during software startup time. This is long hours. We had, there was one developer I hired early who I fired early. Uh, because he was, he was, I hired him on my own. He was local. I knew him. And I kept giving him assignments that this is, this is early prototype, thought architecture days and so on. And I would give him assignments that I would expect him to take a month and he'd come back two days later with a sheet of paper. It's like, no, that's not what I'm expecting. It's, this is what I need you to do. He's doing things like this. And then he started coming in late and leaving early and it's finally like, okay. We had one other developer who was, who was very bright, but had some significant emotional problems. <laughs> and we probably kept him about a year longer than we should have because he was so bright and because there were things he did so well. But it got to be so toxic. And unfortunately, I wasn't the one who had to fire him. We'd already had Jim Hammerly on board, and Jim finally just took him aside and said, yeah, I'm sorry, you're out here. Yeah. How big was the engineering staff? We had about eight. <coughs> Depending on, on, on how, you, how you classify people, eight to 10. But, but a core group of about eight. And I spent a year and a half to hire those eight, yeah. What do you mean with severe emotional? Do you mean like narcissist or like the Oh, just person? sort of, oh, he, was, he was having some very intense <clears throat> emotional, personal issues in his personal life and started writing like 20 page screeds about what he was going through and distributing it to the other team members. Uh, and he was very negative. He basically thought everyone else on the team was stupider than him. Uh, he was very smart, but everyone else was actually getting, getting more work done. Uh, for, for the last year, a lot of what he does was, you're all stupid, this is all going to fail. 
uh, and we got rid of them and, and we shipped the product. Uh, <coughs> now the problem here, and we're going to talk about this when we get into peopleware, is that upper management often sees engineers as interchangeable and subject to simple motiv motivations. Uh, again, at Pages, uh, there's a point at which the CEO, we were, we were, this is during the year that we were late. Okay, and the CEO and CFO are trying to come up with motivations. Well, you know, if they don't get it done by this date, then you know, we're just going to have to fire people. And, you know, if they do this, we'll give everyone a bonus. We'd all been working 70 hours a week for, for three years, okay? We've been working our butts off. And uh, my sister, who was, who was one of our senior software engineers, heard the latest things coming down from senior management. And she stopped me in the hallway and looked at me and says, don't they know they're dealing with grown-ups? It's like they're dealing with us like we're grade school kids. You know, you don't, if, if you behave well, you have to go to recess. If not, you have to sit in the corner. It's like, you know, we're all, we're all software professionals who have many years of, of good, successful professional experience behind us. They treat us like professionals. Any observations of this in your own experiences? Is either work, internship, anything like that? Yes? I mean, it's not really a software thing, but I can reaffirm the upper management sort of viewing people as interchangeable cogs from my dad's workplace, where he frequently, he, he joined the company early, so he had enough clout to defend his own little corner, but he would frequently get into disagreements with his boss because he had people who didn't show up at the right time, though they did, you know, arrange the schedule more flexibly. But, you know, to him it was, we can just replace them with someone else who does show up at the right time. I, I had a similar discussion with John Curry at Pages. I, I have tremendous respect for him. Trust me, Pages, here, here is the single most important thing. Well, there are a lot of things I learned at Pages. One of the most important things I learned, John Curry was our CFO, uh, certified public accountant, lots of experience. We would meet as a senior staff once a week, and he would hand us out a spreadsheet that showed, that basically was the company's finances projected out for the next 18 months. Here's our cash on hand. Here's our burn rate in all these categories. Here's when we run out of money. And we either have to, you know, if we don't want to close our doors on this date, <laughs> we either have to bring money in, either by raising investment, uh, or actually having product to sell, or we have to cut staff. Uh, the, uh, how many of you are familiar with Tom Godwin's science fiction short story, The Cold Equations? You should go track it down and read. It's a very short story. Uh, there's some controversies whether the story idea originates with Tom Godwin or not. But basically, simply put, it's a science fiction short story. Uh, this one-man ship pilot is being dropped off. He's just got a regular reaction engine type ship. He's being dropped off in a solar system by a starship. He's got a vital vaccine. There's a disease outbreak on this, this colonized planet. And so basically the starship comes, drops out of hyperspace, drops him off, takes off again. And he's got the fuel necessary to get himself to the planet. And <clears throat> shortly after, after the starship is left, he discovers that this young woman has stowed away on board because her brother's on the planet. And the problem is, this is a reaction ship. He no longer has enough fuel to make it to the planet if she stays on the ship longer than a certain period of time. Which means his ship won't make it, he and her will die, and the colonists on the planet will all die. And the story ends with the girl being ejected from the airlock in order to save the lives of all the colonists down on the planet. There is often in management an, un an unwillingness to look at some of the cold equations <laughs> uh, of software projects in terms of saying, well, we can just sort of wave our hands and get eyeballs and so on, and our software app will be successful and so on and so forth. When the, having spent five years at Pages in the early 90s, looking at the spreadsheet every week and, and knowing what it was like, and uh, we had layoffs at one point about a year before we finally just ran out of money and closed. 
when the dot com boom started in the late nineties, I saw startups that were burning through ten million a month and had no business plan. And I said, This is gonna be so ugly. <laughs> this is gonna end so awful and it did. Uh, it was to anyone with, with ex actual experience in the software industry, the dot com crash in two thousand was utterly predictable. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Conway's Law. <clears throat> this is an old screensaver, Windows screensaver, that some of you may, may recall. 3D pipes, yeah. yeah. The, I've, I've mentioned before there was this project that was two years late, several hundred million dollars over budget. It was supposed to be two years and 180 million when they brought me in. It had been going on for four years. They'd spent 500 million. They had no code ready for uh, for, for uh, production. And basically, they brought me in, and I had a team of three people working under me and spent three months reviewing it. And this kept coming to mind because one of my first questions is okay, who's the chief architect? Who's the head of QA? There was no chief architect, there was no head of QA. The software project was divvied up across all these different divisions of Fannie Mae, and within each division was divvied up. And this is pretty much my mental image of what the system architecture was like which is why it wasn't ready for production and it was almost impossible to test. You had such a, uh, a dysfunctional organization trying to build a large critical uh, system. Conway's Law, Fred Brooks, you may recall from Mythical Man Month, basically says, the system you build will reflect the organization, communications organization of the group building it. Uh, so if you look carefully at your org charts, that's going to give you a clue as to the sort of product you're building. And if it doesn't match, the, if the, the organization your org chart doesn't match your anticipated organization or architecture of your software, you may need to reorganize. So that's, that's, that's all that Conway's Law goes to. Just remember that architecture tends to reflect organization more than the other way around, unless you're very explicit. Any thoughts, comments, observations? Questions? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. We've talked about this some, I won't spend a lot of time, uh, and this is very specialized, but when you get out in the real world, you'll find that organizations spend an awful lot of money maintaining their existing systems. And they tend to put two sorts of people in there. First are entry levels, so be warned. Uh, and the second are, and, and I, I say this to someone, who would have a lot of gray in my beard, actually my beard would be completely white if I still had my beard. Uh, a lot of old timers who know all the ins and outs of the systems don't have a lot of advantage, but sort of have a very secure job because they're the only ones who know how to maintain it. The problem is that when you start trying to either do bug fixes on production <coughs> systems, trying to add enhancements, which is the single most popular thing to do with production systems, or to replace them, you often lack someone who understands the whole organization's IT ecosystem. And what you get is this effort. I see this on a lot of failed projects. They're trying to replace this one system, and oh, we're going to pull this out and replace it. And it has implications far beyond what the, the original project proponents ever ex expected, because it's touching all these other systems. It's touching business processes and so on and so forth. So, this is this is a solution which is to have a maintenance architect. Go read the article. Don't need to spend a lot of time on this unless you all have questions on this. This is a very brief article, but this is something to keep carefully in mind. Uh, and I first learned this as a consultant. As a consultant, I found that there were actually three groups that I had to deal with who often had conflicting goals. Upper management, particularly those who are contro either controlling the first strings and or seeking to build their power and influence by it. The actual developers uh, who are going to build this, whether they, you know, the, if, if it's an outside, if, if I was part of an outside development group, then it's sort of like the internal MIS uh, that I have to, who, who don't want this outside code coming and the end users. And the goals and expectations of all three are often quite different. Uh, 
And what, what often is seen as, well, this should be perfectly rational, and we're doing this, and so on and so forth, often becomes games where the three groups don't even agree on the game they're playing. Uh, you know, I often say the, the, the geeks are playing Destiny, the suits are playing poker, and the users just want to balance your checkbooks. That's sort of the, the mindsets, but they talk at cross purposes to each other. You need to be very much aware of that uh, and ask yourselves with any IT project you're involved in, you know, how do the developers envision this? How does upper management envision this? And how are the potential end users, be those internal end users or customers, how do they envision it? Uh, and make sure you've considered all three of these because you can, problems with any one of these three can basically wreck the project. Any comments, observations, questions? I'm reminded of, if anyone's paid attention to recent Disney news, I've heard a few times where they've had a subgroup of, I guess, whatever, will make a movie, and then they bring in upper management who then makes some changes because the tone and the world feels like get their image. So I guess you could say that's probably some of the I, I actually follow the movie industry a lot, and I'm sort of in awe that any good movies get made because it gets you have the you know assistant producer's girlfriend being cast in there and so on. There, there, there's some truly, truly insane and stupid decisions that are made in Hollywood with projects costing tens of millions and occasionally hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but yes, it's it's often the same thing. Other comments, questions? And just because yeah. the same thing happens a lot in the game industry, where the yeah. suit, where most suits don't even really care what this ship so long as it makes the money. And the people who are passionate about it, being the geeks and the users, they are left producing a crappy game and playing a crappy game. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen that. I've seen it, particularly when you see, and, and we're almost in the season for it, where you see games pushed out in October that are not, the, for the Christmas rush, that are not ready for prime time. Uh, and uh, that, that seems, uh, it, it seems like every fall there's one anticipated game that just gets pushed out before it's ready and creates a big backlash and everyone says, well, you know, we're sorry and we're, you know, we're going to fix it all and so on. And finally, about four to six months later, it's fixed. And, and everyone's like, why did they do this? Because this happens every year. <laughs> Have they not learned their lessons? On the other hand, if they get those pre-orders, it's kind of like, you know, bam, big cash flush. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, the suits are like, yeah, we're happy. Uh, we got this out there. I don't care how, how upset the users are by it. <laughs> yes? That not, help that to not happen? You, you, well, part of it is you have to learn. And that's actually an excellent question. As IT people, you have to learn how to talk to the business people and you have to learn how to talk to the end users. And often they don't want to talk to them. Uh, but it's very important to learn to listen to what, say, management is saying, and then try to reflect it back, because they'll often say one thing when actually they, they're, they're real concerned with something else. Uh, there is a reason why in the IT industry you have this, this enmity between management, particularly between sales and marketing, and IT. It's kind of like, I mean, I've, I have had shouting matches, I mean, Rand Shulman, I have great respect for Rand Shulman. He was our VP of Marketing at, at, at Pages. But I had a literal yelling match with him when he came back from a customer visit and said, oh yeah, we promised him this, this, and this in Pages. And I said, are you nuts? I said, we're not going to put that in there. We can't put that in there in the time. Well, we have to. Rip. Rand, we can't. You know, I mean, literally was yelling at him in the hallway uh, for having made this commitment to a customer that I knew that my development team could not meet. Uh, and I, I was I was furious. I was absolutely furious. Uh, there were a couple occasions where I came about that close to quitting over some of those issues. Uh, and and trust me, there will be. I mean, I I hear this from my daughter who works at Solution Reach, who just 
she's got some great managers, but they have some people who come and say, oh, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and she's like, are they nuts? What don't they understand about what the actual <laughs> implications are of what they're trying to do? Yes, Matthew. So, I mean, your marketing story, how do you prevent that from happening? Where, I mean, you've gotta give them some leash to, uh, I mean, well, that, that, the, the point is that you, you can't prevent it from happening. They, they have to have the responsibility to come talk to you ahead of time and say, what's feasible? You know, if we really push, what could we put in that would help me to make this sale? Uh, that's not what happened with this case with Rand. They, they went and saw a big government client. No, it was a law firm, big law firm client. And, uh, you know, came back and said, oh yeah, we, they, they wanted this, and we said we could do that. It's like, we can't do that. <laughs> at least not, not in the time frame you're looking at. We just literally can't. Uh, it's not possible. Well, why isn't it? You know, you guys do all this stuff quick. It's like, Randall, let me tell you. That's not going to work. Okay. 